because an ever-growing number of people would like to extend the idea of animal rights much further. Will Kimlicka, a professor of philosophy at Queen's University, has even claimed, quote, that some animals should be seen as forming sovereign communities, and that others should be seen as full citizens of the polity. He means citizens like you and me. The Australian philosopher, Peter Singer. Singer started it all in 1975 with his book, Animal Liberation. What leads such minds to embrace philosophical notions so alien to the Western traditions of individualism and responsibility? Thinkers such as Kim Lika philosophize solely on the grounds of pity. Singer denounces speciesism and claims that we should show equal respect to the lives of human beings and animals. All three refuse to distinguish between the claim that we have responsibility to animals and the claim that animals have rights. A, ba, le, ciel. In some ways, the topic of this video is a little bit philosophically dense and difficult. I'm going to drop a few names that you may not have heard of before. Names of authors, political leaders who are significant in veganism in the 21st century. And in some ways, what we're dealing with here is really so simple as to be fascinating. Part of what makes the progress of veganism as a movement unpredictable is that vegans aren't just alienated from politics ongoing in the mainstream meat-eating discourse. To a remarkable extent, vegans are alienated from the natural sources of leadership that might give the movement its direction. These things are obvious to vegans, so obvious that sometimes we forget about them and chuckle at them when we're reminded of them, but they are bizarre, surreal, and unexpected to people who are looking at the vegan movement from the outside. Um, the vast majority of vegans hate the Humane Society of the United States. Hate it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's surreal. Meat eaters don't get that. For meat eaters, oh, what do you mean? This is an animal welfare group. They're trying to help animals. They seem to represent the same things you people. No, no, no. Intense, bitter hatred. You can hear that on Go Vegan Radio. Some of the podcasts, they really lay into the Humane Society. This, you know, pent up anguish and resentment from decades of conflict between especially older vegans in the movement and the Humane Society of the United States. Even if we just stuck with that one example, it really is a great kind of cautionary tale or red flag. It's an instructive example of why someone like Jordan Peterson, passing judgment from the outside looking in, really wouldn't know what he was seeing, wouldn't know how to evaluate it, and really just wouldn't know what direction the vegan movement is moving in. Um, the vast majority of vegans, I think in 2017, hate PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, P-E-T-A, PETA. Um, I feel it's safe to say right now that the vast majority of informed vegans, vegans who care about politics, um, despise the legacy of Peter Singer. And one of the reasons I think it's easy to say that is that the few vegans who still really support Peter Singer's positions normally have caveats saying, look, I know this is unpopular, but... They normally set it up and explain themselves quite carefully because they're aware of, again, this alienation, <laughs> not just separating vegans from mainstream politics, but separating vegans from the people whom you might call the natural leaders of the vegan movement. But they're not. From inside veganism, it's obvious to us why Peter Singer is not a natural leader, why he's not in a leadership position, or why any claim to him having moral authority would be challenged, shouted down, or even just laughed at. It's a little bit harder to deal with the extent to which a figure like Gary Francione is hated. Of all the names I've just mentioned, if you haven't read their work, Gary Francione, his views are the most fashionable and the most widely accepted in 2017, whereas Peter Singer is not fashionable and is not widely accepted. But nevertheless, someone like Gary Francione, he is still very widely hated within veganism. I wouldn't say the majority, but there are really a lot of voices across the board. And again, I mean, it's, it's indicative. I was reading a formal academic book dealing with current vegan politics, and it did support uh, the position of Gary Francione, the abolitionist approach, as he calls it. But I noticed that it prefaced it by saying, look, even though many people hate this guy, and here are the reasons why they hate him, and there's a lot of controversy. So the fact that it had those caveats and those excuses 
showed again that there was an awareness that at least a, a significant percentage of people really just so that makes veganism fractious, fragmentary, difficult for outsiders, outsiders to understand, and really unpredictable, unpredictable intellectually, unpredictable ideologically. The very people and institutions that outsiders would assume to be our natural leaders, we are alienated from. They're not our leaders. And broadly speaking, we reject their leadership, even if we have nothing better to replace it with, right? So now I'm going to digress because in some ways things are a lot simpler than this kind of theoretical discussion may make them seem. 300 years from now, 300 years into the future, do you think human beings are still going to be wearing leather shoes? Do you think human beings are still going to raise cows in captivity, kill them, take the skin off them, put the skin through a chemical tanning process, and create a material out of the misery of these animals, a material that is an ecological disaster at every single stage of its production, and a material that, believe it or not, also poisons the people who wear it. There's a great video from Maud Vegan. I'll add a link in the description. She has a long video discussing actually the completely non-vegan reasons why people should stop wearing leather. Vegans already know why they want to avoid wearing leather. But even if you're not vegan, it turns out there are toxic chemicals involved like chromium hexane. And their impacts are not just on the rivers next to the factories where the leather is tanned and produced and what have you. Uh, believe it or not, the toxic chemicals used in producing leather, some of them have really negative health impacts on people themselves. So leather is an obsolete material now in 2017. Already, today, it's obsolete. Already, you'll notice that the U.S. military is not using leather boots as combat boots anymore. They used to in the past, and now they're using non-leather materials, high-tech rubber and plastics and uh, other, other materials like that that work better and don't need to be constantly polished. Given that leather is already obsolete, given that it is an ecological disaster, given that there are issues of toxicity, given that it is bad for your health, just like meat and dairy, leather is in fact bad for your health. Believe it or not, there are scientific effects to back that up. It's releasing chromium hexane and you're breathing it in and so on. It's strange but true. Sometimes truth is strange. Given these facts, even if there were no ethical argument for veganism, we can ask ourselves, would humanity be wearing leather shoes 300 years from now? And I think the answer is no. And once you have that answer, once you think to yourself that the answer is no, then you start to ask yourself, well, when is the change going to happen and where is it going to start? Vegans are the people who answer, the change has got to start now and it starts with me. I am going to take responsibility to the small extent that I can or maybe if you're a powerful and influential person, maybe to a larger extent, you can really take on a leadership role. You can start a foundation. You can engage in activism, lobbying, public education outreach. Maybe you can do more than just changing your diet and consumer habits. But at a minimum, you say, it starts with me. The change starts here and now. Looking ahead to that change 300 years in the future. Okay? Now... <laughs> Veganism as an idea is so simple that any child could arrive at it out of thin air. And in every civilization where we have a well-documented history of philosophy, we have the idea of vegetarianism or veganism, something along those lines, popping up more or less spontaneously. I know of one example within the Muslim world. There may be a couple others. But generally, whenever you have a highly literate society that leaves us written records, we will get records of intellectuals who came up with this idea more or less on their own. And, uh, you know, we have some big names in the history of European philosophy. Uh, we got Plutarch. <laughs> Even if Jordan B. Peterson were 100% right in heaping scorn on, you know, these figures whom he mentions, even if we're all going to agree that somebody like Peter Singer is to be uh, laughed at and scorned. And I do agree. I actually would go much further than, than Jordan Peterson in his critique of Peter Singer, even if we agree that a figure like Will Kimlicka should be scorned, and I agree and go further. Well, we also have figures like uh, Plutarch. We have some of the most influential philosophers, thinkers, and authors in the history of Western civilization. And I would go so far in, in praising uh, 
Plutarch as a specific example. I can give you a link below the video to his work also. A um, few different websites have uh, from the history of vegetarianism, history of veganism, etc. You know Plutarch's essay, and he has, he has various mentions, come a couple times in his writing, about vegetarian or veganism. I think it's really striking that the arguments he presents for why people should not eat meat, I think they're more coherent and more substantive than any argument I could offer you from the history of Buddhism in Asia. I've been through the extant literature of Buddhism in Asia, but yes, also in Asia, different Eastern religions have come to this incredibly simple conclusion that basically human beings should do the best that they can, and doing the best that you can involves not eating meat, not killing animals for no particularly good reason, <laughs> etc. So Plutarch came to that conclusion. A lot of different voices within Buddhist East Asia came to that conclusion, where there were cultural and religious fa factors that perhaps favored it. Um, it's not hard for people to come to that conclusion in any particular period of history. So it's really regrettable to hear someone like Jordan B. Peterson trying to fetishize the voices of just a few people, in his case, just Peter Singer and Will Kimlicka, two authors whom I despise and whose arguments for veganism are deeply flawed, as if they invented it. Okay, As a prefatory note here, as a caveat, we have to say in the history of philosophy, it is tremendously common for people to arrive at a meaningful conclusion from a meaningless premise. People can come to a true conclusion from a false set of premises, from false reasoning. It happens all the time in the history of philosophy. So uh, let me be clear. Veganism can still be right if Peter Singer is wrong. And vegans, insiders know that because we've got all kinds of different thinkers, most of whom disagree with uh, Peter Singer. Veganism can still be right if Plutarch is wrong. But hey, let's be real here. Somebody like Plutarch trumps Peter Singer many, many centuries earlier as an author and many times more famous and many times more influential, many times more important. So we can't pretend that Peter Singer invented these things here. Um, fundamentally, the argument that Peter Singer invented veganism is about as stupid as claiming that the Beastie Boys invented hip-hop. Randomly or not so randomly, Peter Singer ended up being the guy to appear on the nightly news. And for a lot of us growing up, the Beastie Boys were one of the first big stories to get on the mainstream nightly news talking about rap music, talking about hip-hop as a genre of music. For a lot of people, if they were watching mainstream white American TV news or the TV news in England, Beastie Boys were huge in England, they might really have this delusion that the Beastie Boys were much more important than they were, that the Beastie Boys were the first rap group. But <laughs> for an insider, for someone who cares about that genre of music, for someone who cares about that subculture, it's completely laughable and completely ridiculous to think that. In the same way, the emphasis that's placed here on Peter Singer is completely laughable. And there's no explanation for why so much emphasis is put on Will Kemlicka. Now, my channel, uh, sorry, 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 in contrast to Plutarch, why would Will Kemlicka, who's heard of Will Kemlicka? I have on my channel, I've, I've done a book review of his work. I have two videos very harshly condemning his book, one more politely, one more harshly and honestly condemning it. I can give those links below this video too. Um, why would Will Kimlicka be more important in this discussion than Plutarch? Even if we're just using that one name of one major famous ancient figure who presented a sustained and coherent argument for veganism. Because Plutarch gets into it. If you actually read you know, um, Plutarch's essay from uh, Moralia on the, the morality of a vegetarian or vegan diet, he gets into many of the same arguments and examples that we still use, that we still hear in discussions about veganism today. He points out that human beings don't have fangs or claws or beaks. He points out that if a human being thinks that it's really natural for the human diet to include uh, beef, then why can't human beings with their own teeth throttle the neck of a cow? Why can't human beings eat the meat of a cow raw the way that wolves and lions do? All those arguments are there. So it's amazing. Approximately 2,000 years ago, um, not quite 2,000 years ago now, you know, these same discussions, these same debates were ongoing. And again, they're simple enough, they're fundamental enough that they can arise in a vacuum. They can arise in the middle of Europe where there isn't a major religion like Buddhism to foster these debates. 
Anyone can come to these conclusions by looking around at the reality of the meatpacking industry, the reality of a slaughterhouse, the reality of a human diet, and the reality of human, even human biology, and say, hey, I'm going to question this. I'm going to come to some new conclusions. And when you come to those conclusions, you look around at your fellow men and say, what? Are you guys all crazy? You guys regard this as normal, but as soon as an outsider questions it, as soon as a free thinker questions it, as soon as a real philosopher independently questions those norms, they start to think, hey, maybe everyone, including my own parents and grandparents, is crazy because they regard meat eating as normal, but I don't. I'm going to question the normalcy of it. I'm going to challenge those norms. I'm going to try to take my morality in a new direction. Okay? Um, <laughs> right. Even if Peter Singer is wrong, it doesn't mean that veganism is wrong. And I have to emphasize that all the time, I do meet vegans who are vegan for the wrong reasons, who are vegan because they believe in something supernatural that I don't believe in. Uh, you can see also um, my book review or my critique of Will Tuttle's World Peace Diet. I don't believe in Will Tuttle's approach to veganism, which is a mix mishmash of kind of supernatural, new age, hippie nonsense, a lot of which... I totally reject, and I have a video talking about that. So I reject someone like him. I reject the reasoning of someone like Will Kimlicka. <laughs> I reject the reasoning of Peter Singer. And like I say, we're in this bizarre situation where the majority of vegans reject people the ethical treatment of animals, PETA. They reject Humane Society, the United States. We are in a leaderless, amorphous position. We're looking around. And we feel alienated from most of the would-be figureheads, whether we're talking about individuals, authors, intellectuals, institutions, or activist organizations. I got a couple more messages just this month from people who had signed up with DXE, Direct Action Everywhere, another would-be leadership group. And they were writing in and telling me that my warnings about that group were really true. And they regretted. One guy was telling me that he regretted he wasted years of his life with that vegan or organization. And that he said that the warnings on my channel were really true and he wished he'd seen them before. He wished he'd listened to them before. And he hadn't lost those years of his life. So there's a huge sense of disappointment with quite a few different organizations and authors and intellectuals who have tried to be leaders of the vegan movement. But still, if I meet someone who is vegan for the wrong reasons, let's say they're vegan just because they believe in a supernatural theory of karma and that animals have magical souls, totally supernatural view. I can still respect their veganism, even if I don't respect their reasons for being vegan. And when I talk to meat eaters, what I basically ask them is, why can't you? Why can't you recognize the discipline itself? Why can't you recognize the diet itself? Why can't you recognize the ecological impacts and the health impacts as good in themselves? Why is it that you have to pin it to a perfectly coherent philosophical argument or otherwise dismiss it as nothing worth? I can respect vegans for their veganism, even if they've come to that conclusion for a series of reasons that are wrong or deeply flawed or that are, from my perspective, nonsensical, right? Um... Somebody, every so often people ask me, what about this other personality on YouTube? What about this other vegan leader? They'll ask about some particular example who is bad or deeply flawed. I mean, I say, but even though this person is flawed, even though their arguments are wrong, they've still led others to convert to veganism. And I say back to them, yeah, but you know what? I've met people who became vegan because of a car crash. It doesn't mean that car crashes are good. You can become vegan because you witnessed a car crash. You can become vegan because you saw an animal get hit by the side of the road, or you saw a truck full of pigs that tipped over and the pigs are struggling to get free. A lot of people have those shocking incidents on the side of the road. Sometimes they just pull over at a gas station and there's a broken down truck that was on its way to the slaughterhouse and had to stop. And the animals are in the back in misery and they see that for the first time. It doesn't mean car crashes are good because car crashes convert people to veganism. Okay, And a lot of the would-be intellectuals and would-be activists and would-be leaders on YouTube and even in the PhD-wielding, respectable academic literature, a lot of those people are car crashes, frankly. And I know they convert vegan people to veganism. I know new people become vegan because of those sources. It doesn't mean they're good. It doesn't mean they're right. And conversely, 
it doesn't mean I have to disrespect you as a vegan just because I may not agree with your reasons for being vegan or the context of questions and answers that led you to being vegan in the first place. As I said recently, I don't respect the line of reasoning that basically looks at pets, dogs, cats, domesticated animals, and then says, well, all animals should be treated this way, all animals should be pampered, etc. And then seeks to construe veganism as really centered on the model of the human-pet relationship of pampering and caring for domesticated animals. I don't believe in that. I believe in a model that instead looks at wildlife and the status of wild animals in a wildlife reserve and says this is the normal relationship between humans and animals where we leave them to have independent, dignified lives, including dignified deaths that we fundamentally have as little to do with as possible, where we don't castrate them, domesticate them, declaw them, and uh, at the same time give them, I don't know, shampoo and earrings and uh, colored dye in their hair. I see all that here in China. We got, we got purple dogs walking the streets here in China right now. But I digress. Um, personally, I am deeply opposed to the philosophy of both Will Kimlicka and Peter Singer. I am much more opposed. Ironically, I am more opposed to these two examples, Will Kimlicka and Peter Singer, than Jordan Peterson is. Okay? But still, even if they are vegan for the wrong reasons, I can respect their veganism as such. If you're a meat eater, why can't you? And still, even if every single one of our leaders in veganism were as wrong-headed as Will Kimlicka and Peter Singer, were as detached from reality, in my biased opinion. You can see my earlier video discussing Will Kimlicka and his philosophy. I think you'll find it shocking. <sighs> Still, I can ask you simply, 300 years from now in the future, when you imagine the science fiction future with all the progress of science and technology, 300 years from now in the future, do you imagine that human beings are going to be wearing leather shoes. And if not, if you can admit in the Star Trek, Star Wars, fictional, science fiction universe, 300 years now, if you can admit that there and then under those circumstances, it doesn't make sense to have an animal live its whole life on a concrete floor under a steel shed sky to be born and live and suffer just to die, to have its skin turned into a pair of shoes. Then when does the change start to happen? Because for us, it starts now. A, bas, le, ciel, 